Hey, if you never canned your own food or you felt intimidated by canning and making jams and jellies, then this is a video for you. In this video, we do away with complicated equipment such as pressure cookers, etc. And we simplify this down for a kitchen that you have at your home that you can make this super easy and fast for your family or your friends or yourself. Uh, so if you've been curious about canning, if you like jams and jellies, then this is a video for you, so stay tuned. Alright, welcome back. So if you're new to my channel, this is a channel where I like to talk about food, various techniques and things that can help you out in your own kitchen and your own adventures in the kitchen. Specifically for this video series, we're working on canning, whether it's fruits, vegetables, etc. So if these topics are of interest to you, then hit that like button, helps more people see the video. And also, if you really like my video and you like my channel, hit the subscribe button. That's going to let you know whenever there is new content that comes up. So today we're going to dig into the world of canning and really specifically dig into how exactly to can properly, what are some techniques, some things to avoid and watch out for, and uh, some mistakes I made and learned from through my canning adventures. Now I began my canning adventures with this book here. It's Food in Jars by Marissa McClellan. It's been super helpful. It's my first book on canning and it was a really good primer. I still use it for a lot of my recipes. So the things that you're seeing in my videos, a lot of them are coming or are inspired by this book. It's really wonderful. I'll have a link for it down in the description for you to check it out. Now her method uses something called water bath canning. And this is a process where you essentially boil your jars of jam in hot water for about 10 minutes doesn't require a pressure cooker, doesn't require anything special. Now this method only works for high acid fruits. So if you don't have a high acidic fruit, then you're gonna have to add acid uh, through other means, such as adding a lemon, which is the easiest and uh, most common way people do it. So why do we care about acid? Well, we care about acid because of a bacteria called botulism. The acid in the food itself helps neutralize that bacteria it prevents it from taking hold in the first place. So my primary worries when I started out canning and making my own food were with bacteria and I didn't want to give myself poisoning, but I wanted my jams and jellies to be shelf stable. All right. So to do that, you need to introduce acid into your jams. Now we do this a couple of ways, but the main way to do it is to add fresh squeeze of lemon or lime juice into your recipe itself. If you are ever concerned about your particular recipe, jam or jelly that's been sitting on a shelf for a while, then some obvious signs to look for is going to be bubbling inside the jam, right? So it should not be bubbling. And we're talking about, you know, you're coming back to your jam seven, 10 days later, 90 days later, or a year later, you're coming back to it, you're opening it up and you're noticing there's mold in there, it's bubbling, and it smells really awful, right? If any of those three things are present, don't eat the jam, throw it away, right? It's a bad jam or it's a bad batch. That's something to be mindful of, but it's very obvious. Now, fruits that don't naturally have a lot of acid in them, they're gonna need a little bit extra acid thrown in there. So some naturally low acid foods inclu include things like bananas, mangoes, uh, figs even, and surprisingly enough, even tomatoes are a low acid fruit and they do not contain enough acid for them to be preserved or to be shelf stable for a long period of time without adding extra acid and processing it slightly differently than you would for your common jams and jellies that you might make. Now let's talk about cooking times. Cooking times themselves vary anywhere between 10 minutes up to an hour. Uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes would be pretty typical for a jam like made of strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, any, anything like that. Uh, where I have taken a long time was with marmalades. Um, in particular, my blood orange marmalades took about an hour or so to cook. And a lot of factors can impact the cooking times, right? How much liquid is there in the fruit? So depending on the time of the year that it was picked, where it's coming from, maybe the fruit absorbed a lot of water, maybe it didn't. 
So all those things that you don't necessarily know about that you will get to know through your fruit and once it's all chopped up and it's in a pot, you're gonna start to pick up on those little things here and there and you will see like, oh, okay, this jam is a little bit too liquidy. I need to cook it down a little bit longer. You also wanna monitor your jam temperature while it's cooking consistently uh, to make sure that it's getting up to the right temperature point. And that temperature point is gonna be 220 degrees Fahrenheit or 105 degrees Celsius. Once it reaches that point, then that jam has set and it's ready to be canned. Now I'm gonna throw up a chart here, but you do have to make some adjustments. Right here in San Francisco, I am at sea level. That means I don't have to make any adjustments to my recipes. So anybody between sea level and 1000 feet above sea level is fine. You don't need to make any adjustments to your recipe, but I'll throw up a chart here and that's gonna show you the kinds of adjustments you might need to make depending on your altitude. Now, before we jump into a test recipe, I wanna go over the equipment that you're gonna need. So the first item here is gonna be a pot for cooking your jam, right? So that's the main item here. This is an all clad uh, three quart pot. Yeah, three quarts pot. You want these to be large and wide. You can use a thick, tall uh, pot. The issue with those is that they slow down the evaporation. So something like this, that's super wide, exposes more of the surface area to the air, which allows the jam and the liquids to evaporate much faster. Make sure you are not using cast iron, you are not using aluminum. Those two things are gonna impart really bad flavor or they're gonna burn the jam, right? So something like this, that's stainless steel, that's made of cast iron that's enameled, such as Le Creuset, those are gonna work really well. So this is the most important piece of your equipment that you need to have. Now, in addition to your cooking pot, you're also gonna need a big pot of water and that's gonna be used for boiling your jars. So here I have a really tall pot and this is actually a pressure cooker, but I don't use it as a pressure cooker, at least not in this recipe. But the reason it's very useful is because of this, it's got a little colander in there that's used for steaming vegetables. It has a little separator, so it keeps the colander up. And this is important because what you don't want to do is you don't want, you don't want your jars touching the bottom of the pot because they're going to break or you run a risk of them breaking. Now I haven't had any of mine break yet. So, you know, this is one of those like do as I say, not as I do type of examples. Uh, I don't always do this. I just, you know, drop them in. If you want to be safe so that your glass doesn't break and you don't lose your, all your jam and you don't make a huge mess, I'd recommend if you have a colander, you could even use like a plain colander. And as long as the pot is deep enough and wide enough that the colander can fit in there and the jars can fit, they don't even need to be upright. You can just toss them in there on, on their side. So if it's not tall enough with the colander, you can make that work. Obviously, you're also gonna need the jars. So this is a really nice four ounce jars. I really like the four ounce ones uh, compared to the eight ounce ones. And the reason being is for sharing with friends, which is what I inevitably end up doing a lot of. Uh, these are really convenient because you can split them up into really small batches. They're really cute. Uh, I'd recommend. The thing here with this lid is it's got this uh, brown, dark, dark orange stick around it. So this is an adhesive and it's made of rubber. So what happens is that just before you can these, what you want to do is have a little pan of water, hot water, and you want to have these boiling in the water just before uh, you stick them on here. What that's going to do is it softens this rubber. Goes without saying, you need measuring cups, right? You can't do this without measuring. I've found it's really useful for pouring the jam itself. Next up is a thermometer. You need a candy thermometer. You can use any candy thermometer you have. Cheap $10 ones work just as well as this $100 one, which is like a little bit excessive, but I cook a lot and it's really nice. This is a, what does it say? Uh, Zachary between negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit up to 572 with a, I believe they said 0 0.2 degree Fahrenheit or one degree, I don't know, 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit accuracy. So it's excessively accurate, It's but it's really good, uh, which actually causes me sometimes to overthink my jam and jelly. So 
I think actually if you have a more low tech thermometer, I think you're gonna find this whole experience a lot more enjoyable and less stressful where you're uh, worrying about every single degree of Fahrenheit as you're going through. So, neck, super helpful, flat bottom spatula. Flat bottom spatula helps you get everything off the bottom of the pot. So now these are the most valuable thing I have, I think, because these are super helpful. You don't have to expose your hands to hot liquid, to the hot jam. You can do everything at a distance, right? You got enough, uh, space there between you and the hot water and the hot jam so this keeps you safe this is so convenient finally one optional thing is liquid pectin not all my jams use pectin some do some don't i kind of make a decision based on the jam itself as i'm going through it and seeing how it's behaving you can literally make any single of these recipes you can make it without pectin uh and we have a really great farmer's market here in San Francisco and I'm friends with a guy who uh, actually just sells jams and jellies. I think he's got like 60 different jams and jellies and none of them use pectin whatsoever and he's got a huge fruit farm and every single one of his jams uh, is without pectin. I'll just show you a demo of what it would look like if you were doing this at home and how all these pieces all come together. So let's go to the kitchen. So here we are on the assembly line and it's basically, this is everything it takes, right? So we have our big pot of boiling jam. Uh, we have our zester and thermometer. I zested the lemon already and the juice. So I'm just gonna add that in. So that's that. We'll need the, temp um, the thermometer to gauge the temperature, but it's not quite ready yet. Here we have two pots. You can actually combine these into one, but uh, I'm keeping them separate here. So what we have is lids in one. I'll just keep them hot to disinfect them. And then the other pot here, I have water that's almost boiling with three jars in them. Now it is important to have these boil before you can them because that's killing any of the dangerous bacteria that might have gotten on them. That's also killing the bacteria. This is also killing the bacteria. So everything here should be super duper clean, right? Like there's nothing here that should be dangerous if you're doing all of this properly. You, I have the tongs up on, on here as well. So these are very useful for, uh, you wanna actually drop these jars in way ahead of time. Um, so that they come to up to the boiling temperature together with the water that way they're not going into temperature shock For the lids themselves, you'll be able to ground like this. You can toss them on top of the of Jars, so it's really convenient to have these tongs as I was saying now that our jam is ready I'll show you how to finish this up. So first what you want to do is ladle the jam into uh, this cup measure I was just testing out this recipe, but this is really good. I might make a video about this one specifically, actually, in the future. 12 ounces here, which is really nice because then you can, you know exactly what you need from your uh, jars. And over on the left, let's check on this. So we got our jars that are boiling, which is perfect. So here's how you do this. Take your tongs, you take your jar, you flip it up, get the water out of it. So now that is disinfected, we bring it up here. You don't want to go all the way to the top, right? So to the brim, you want to just go just below about half an inch or so. That's plenty. You need the air gap. So we'll take the lid here, that. So we're not touching with our hands, right? There's no cross contamination happening. So this goes down like this. You can. Put it in position with your hands so that's that and then you put a screw top on it it's almost done but it's not quite done right so you can hear that that means it doesn't have a seal right in order to create this seal we have to boil these jars so they're super hot now uh, careful touching it with your hands what you do now is grab it with your tongs like that just below the rim or above the rim either way it works and we put it back into the boiling water 
And we're gonna give it 10 minutes of boiling in there. The room at the top is important because what's going to happen is when we take this jar out after 10 minutes, the differences in pressure between the air and what the temperature is inside, and that's gonna create a seal. So these caps that you were able to click up and down, they will no longer do that. And that's why you have all these jars that tell you at the store is like reject, you know, do not accept this jar if the cap is going up and down, right? Because it shows you that it's not sealed and therefore you cannot guarantee that, that the contaminants haven't been introduced into the jar. This, I like to always seal them. So you don't have to do this. If you're gonna eat these gems, by the way, if you're gonna eat these within a week or two, you don't need to go through this second process. So you don't need to bother with it because nothing's gonna really grow in that amount of time and you'll keep them in the fridge. So totally cool. If you wanna keep them in a cupboard like I do. So this is my stash of jars and jams and jellies, which is insane. I'm doing a pistachio one soon. Uh, then you definitely want to boil them, right? So this boiling process is only if you're storing them long term for more than a, a few weeks and you want to mail them out to people, etc. Then you want to do that. So all right, so it's time to pull these. And I'll start with the little one here, and hopefully we get it. But we should be able to hear it pop. And sometimes it comes a minute or two later. Sometimes ten minutes. Sometimes right away. So let's just see. That was it. So once you hear that popping, it means it's ready. And uh, now it's good for long-term storage. You can take off the screw cap and that's it. You don't need to keep these lids on. I mean, it's nice just for appearance, but they're really not necessary. They only need it for the boiling portion. So if it doesn't seal like this, then you can reprocess them again. So put them back and boil for another 10 minutes and take them out and see if uh, that helps it out. All right, so I hope that was helpful. I think once you see this in context, like I showed you, I think it's a lot less intimidating and it's a lot, of, a lot easier to handle, right? So you can see how all these parts come together and it only seems overwhelming because you haven't done it or you haven't had enough experience with it. But once you have this going, it's a really quick process and it shouldn't take too long uh, to make it all come together so be safe when you're making these right don't get burned uh, always cook your jars for at least 10 minutes just to kill off everything and you're gonna be safe i promise you you're not gonna kill your family uh, but if you were going if you're planning on doing it well anyways i'll cut this out of the video but don't do that don't kill anyone with your jams and especially don't tell them i said anything so that's it I hope you enjoyed this video. It took a lot of effort making this, a lot of planning. So if you don't mind, give me a like if you liked the video. If you didn't like it, don't give me a like. That's okay too. If you have questions, let me know down below in the comments. I'm happy to answer questions. If you have ideas for recipes you want me to tackle in the future, some flavors or fruits you want me to look into, combinations, whatever it is, let me know down below and I'll try to include it in one of my next following videos or I'll just respond in line you down below. Finally, check out some of my other videos on my channel. I think you'll really enjoy them. Uh, we're going to be using the same process we saw today here, uh, but uh, we're going to be cutting out the whole canning portion and just focusing on the recipe itself. So if you like this video, you might like the other ones, so check them out. And until next time, live long and prosper.